Welcome to our webinar on three common evaluation fails and how to prevent them. This webinar is hosted by ATE Central, which is an information hub for the National Science Foundation's ATE program. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the Evaluation Support Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate serves the ATE community and others by holding webinars on evaluation like this one, maintaining an open access resource library, curating a blog about STEM education evaluation, and collecting and disseminating data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out Evaluate website to learn more. NSF's ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, and nanotechnologies. Let's take a look at the materials that will be available to you. The slides from this webinar are already posted on Evaluate's website and the materials that the presenters are referencing are also posted there. This webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to you in a few days. Let me introduce myself. I'm Mike, Mike Lasecki with Luca Partners. I'll be the moderator for the webinar today. Kirk Nestis is our main presenter for the webinar. Kirk is a senior consultant at Insiter and Lori Wingate, Director of Evaluate, will be helping Kirk out later in the webinar. What about behind the scenes of this live event? Well, we'd like to recognize our colleagues who have worked to help bring this webinar to you today. That includes Emma Perk and Lissa Becho from Evaluate. Thanks, Emma and Lissa. Mike Rudabaugh from Lakeland College helped us in the preparations of this event and Cynthia Williams, Evaluate's editor from Style Sheets, helped make sure all the words were perfect. Working with me at Luca Partners was Janet Penhorn and Shannon Payne, who was really helping with the IT status and checks for today. Thank you all. This is a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. And now I'll turn things over to Kirk. Go ahead, Kirk. Thank you, Mike, and welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to be able to come back to evaluate and work on some, uh, uh, helping share some understandings with you all about evaluation, particularly in STEM teaching and learning settings. Um, we are talking about the ATE program specifically because they're kind enough to pay the bills on this, but I'm really hoping that what we're going to talk about today will apply more generally to other education programs, other things that we might evaluate, and perhaps even to evaluation more generally. Um, as Mike pointed out, I'm with a firm in Baltimore, Maryland called Insider. I've been an evaluator for about 18 years. I started my education career as a career and technology ed guy teaching, post, uh, teaching secondary and uh, post-secondary uh, technology courses out on the West Coast. Um, I've spent most of my professional life operating in the space of STEM and technology education. Uh, and um, I guess most recently has had the uh, the wonderful luck to be involved with a whole bunch of National Science Foundation evaluations across a number of programs. So uh, I really feel uh, a sense of, of kinship with my PIs out there, and uh, I love this business. I'm hoping that we can make this useful for you today. A um, couple of things just as we get started. There's sort of a theme here that I want to make sure I touch on briefly. This conversation is not going to be about blaming clients uh, for evaluation problems. Occasionally, evaluators will sit around in the dark of the night and grumble about their clients or PIs. But what I want to do today is turn that conversation to a much more positive kind of a orientation. 
you all, clients, PIs, hire evaluators because we're supposed to be expert at what we do. Uh, I would argue that that includes heading off any kind of potential challenges that your evaluations might run into. And I very much advocate for not only clients being able to ask this of their evaluators, but evaluators building their capacity to support what's going on in terms of this conversation to prevent typical challenges from becoming full-grown failures. Uh, and that's really what we're here to talk about today. Um, specifically, a, a good evaluator should employ some management tools to try and avoid these evaluation fails that we're going to talk about today. Uh, I chuckle because we, we're cheating. We've jammed a lot of failure into one hour, so you'll get to see a bunch of things that hopefully won't ever happen to you, but just in case. Um, our job is to try and help all of the audience, both evaluators and prog program managers and designers, how to avoid little problems from turning into bigger problems and ultimately turning into full-grown fails. So we're going to talk about three general families of challenge that yeah, come up over and over in this business. We've categorized them as, number one, project implementation delays. Number two, what we call evaluation scope creep, and I'm going to get to some definitions here in a minute. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the question of project changes, changes to the things that we are evaluating. So in terms of definitions, let's start with implementation delays. This is when the program or the other thing that's being evaluated, I call it the innovation typically, is not being implemented on the planned timeline. Now there's a lot of reasons that this might happen. Um, every program has a proposed timeline. Uh, they can get broken as soon as right out of the gate when you, as a PI, get the good news that your grant-funded project is a go. Um, very often we will run into, um, and this not, is not just about National Science Foundation, but any funded project, challenges during the award or contracting process. Uh, I've had the opportunity to learn something more about how the contract process works in universities uh, over the last couple of years, and the complexity of what's involved is impressive. So uh, this is not an uncommon thing. Another challenge that we run into uh, fairly consistently in this business is lengthy procurement processes. Uh, Grant-funded projects very often buy stuff uh, and very often have to go through a procurement process to hire an external evaluator. These things can take time and these can push the timeline uh, beyond what was originally envisioned. Another common challenge is staffing changes. So, National Science Foundation is not alone in this regard, but it can be months between the time when a proposal is submitted and the award is made, and people change jobs. This is uh, increasingly common, and I think particularly a challenge uh, in community colleges, uh, two-year colleges, where uh, you don't have uh, formal tenure pro uh, procedures that lock folks in for long periods of time, or where uh, programs might be engaging people from the private sector as partners. Another example of a potential source of delay is external factors. Uh, my friends at the Value 8 found this lovely slide, and I, I think it's because I shared an example that we evaluated an out-of-school time STEM learning program at an aquarium on the uh, east coast of the United States, and they got funded and then got clobbered by a huge storm that um, uh, set them back pretty dramatically because their facilities had to be repaired. Last but not least, um, the idea of development delays. This is kind of important. We'll talk more about this as we go through the conversation today. But um, a lot of the programs that are funded are not just to do things, but to create things. And the timelines for creating those things can be lengthy and can easily be delayed. So let's talk about scope creep. Scope creep is uh, when a client needs something more or something different than what was originally planned for the evaluation. Uh, if any of you have ever remodeled a kitchen, you know how this can go. Um, but ultimately, it becomes a challenge when the time or the cost, and so the cost, of the evaluation starts to inc increase. 
Uh, let's talk about some influences on scope creep. Um, external influences, things be beyond the program. So occasionally something will happen, particularly in an institution, uh, education institution, uh, where some new program might be introduced or a new initiative might come down from the dean's office or something. Uh, these things can uh, encourage the, the definition of what's being, what the evaluation work looks like to expand. Sometimes stakeholder needs change. Um, so for example, it may be that you discover that you're not getting the data that you need from a particular type of assessment of a, of a learning outcome, and so it's necessary to do something different that may be more time consuming and so more costly. Other project needs often intrude on this, the uh, scope of an evaluation. So for example, it may be that as the project moves along, you discover that there's different needs for external uh, communication. Your dissemination plans change and you need different kinds of documentation or different analyses to support a different kind of communication, uh, potentially to a different audience. So last but not least on our list of challenges that we're trying to avoid becoming fails, uh, the idea of project changes. Now, this is where the PI or the project team actually makes conscious decisions to change the thing that's being evaluated. The, the audience of the work, um, stakeholder groups, activities, uh, the objectives, the results that you're expecting from the use, in ATE's example, of a particular curriculum or training program or pedagogy to uh, realize outcomes for learners. Um, all of these things can change. These things are often documented in what we call a theory of action or logic model. And so sometimes our understanding of how the program is supposed to work to turn dollars into outcomes for the program can evolve over time. I've alluded to some of the things that can change, um, let's talk about the dimensions uh, along which they might change. Um, you might add new components to a program, particularly if it's in development. You might discover that there's a new strategy that hasn't been considered that makes the entire program more powerful, or a new technology, or um, a new partner or something might come along that improves the program. You may discover that there's participants you hadn't planned for, stakeholder groups. Uh, an example that occurs to me immediately was an instance where a program was originally working with instructors to change uh, their practices in the classroom, but after the first year of implementation, they discovered that there was a real hole in the understandings of students coming in as to what they were getting into. So the um, uh, this particular PI project team engaged the admissions office and the counselors that were placing students in the programs to help do a better job of priming them for the pump. Let's see here. Changes in delivery mode, um, particularly in the world of higher education and particularly with the advent of uh, improving technologies, uh, very often we're seeing programs that are initially described as being um, intended to be, for example, a purely distance ed delivery kind of mode, turning into something more complicated or more sophisticated, like a blended uh, distance learning or blended online model. I've actually evaluated projects that were intended to be online, and it turned out that they just didn't work very well, and they needed to, to go more face-to-face, -face, and vice versa. I've seen online content added to typical brick and mortar kind of deliveries in higher education. Uh, last but not least, and this could be a long conversation, but I'll try and make it quick. Uh, the actual outcomes that are desired for the stakeholders, the participants in programming can change. Uh, we see this a lot with um, workforce development and technology training programs that are partnering with industries. A lot changes, and a lot changes quickly sometimes in the private sector. So you could have a new set of standards come down in a particular industry and need to revamp a program in short order. So we're going to go to the chat here for a little bit. I've actually been trying to watch it with the corner of my eye. Uh, it sounds like some of these things are resonating with you all, but 
we'd like to tap into our audience and have you share some specific challenges that you faced um, that are like or maybe not like what we've just talked about that potentially threatened your evaluation. I'm looking here. And I'm scrolling. Oh, negotiations over funding. Yeah. Um, the um, uh, Particularly uh, for the evaluation is where I see it a lot. We get uh, a specific scope of work and a budget, and occasionally we will have the client PIs come back to us and say, tell us that uh, for whatever reason we need to revise the budget. We've got to go back and work out how to make that fit in a scope of work. Um, Stakeholders, we want uh, data on impossible timelines. Everything's possible. It just costs more money, right? But um, we've got uh, data needs uh, have got to be defined fairly clearly uh, early in the process. So everybody that gets information, uh, that needs information, knows where to get it. Uh, and then you've got, of course, uh, as the participant notes there, keep up with whatever timeline their stakeholders are hoping, hoping for. Let's see here. <clears throat> uh, clients not responding in a timely manner. I'm going to turn that into an agnostic concern that David Monroe has posted, because that works both ways. I very often will hear folks come to me and say, Kirk, what can I do to get my evaluator to respond more quickly when I have a question for her? So uh, we're actually going to be talking a lot about communication today. I think that's a, that's a good predictor, a good good hint of where we might be going with our conversations. So keep thinking about those challenges. But um, as you're doing it, I just want to point out something that this is a theme that internally we've been coming back to uh, evaluate and a lot of other folks in the uh, STEM uh, education evaluation business. And that's this reality that evaluation is messy. A big messy thing. We tend to think of it as having a real clear starting point where you get a contract to do the evaluation. The PI says, well, I got my evaluator. The evaluator says, well, I got this great job. And then at some point there's an end where you deliver that last report and do the last debrief and everything is finished up. But tell you what, the parts in between those two ends can be a real mess. But we're going to talk about uh, some of the influences here briefly that contribute to these translating uh, your implementation delays, scope creep, and changing project needs into evaluation. So first of all, let's make sure we recognize that the programs that we're evaluating are really complicated. If you sit down and start to really parse out all of the pieces of the typical National Science Foundation career or technology workforce development uh, program, they got a lot of moving parts, all kinds of things going on. Um, secondly, uh, the context in which we implement these things are complicated, and they're always changing as well. A three-year or four-year or five-year grant-funded project could see pretty dramatic changes in local business climates, industry technologies, uh, other priorities that are going on in the institution that's managing the project. There's all kinds of things that are changing around the project that's being evaluated. It's important to note, too, that evaluations get done in the context of organizations. And organizations, and I'd argue education organizations particularly, be pretty complicated, and there can be difficulties navigating all of the relationships and the permissions and the uh, power structures that are inherent to these multiple organizations that get involved in a uh, STEM education program. I'm thinking of one right now, and I literally just had a conversation with a client this morning. It's a, uh, a, a consortium project that includes a four-year university, a bachelor's degree grant in university, at four community colleges. And they're all going to be trying to align and integrate their content delivery around this particular STEM content area. It's, uh, it's a huge undertaking. And not only uh, 
Are they going to have internal navigation challenges? They're going to need to negotiate a lot of conversations among the partners. Last but not least is all of these folks, all of the partners, all of the stakeholders, all of the students, the people that are going to be responding to the evaluators' questionnaires to provide data, they're all battling with competing pressures on their time and their engagement. So this can be a real challenge, and we've got to take these things into consideration. So how do we deal with all of this? Uh, we are going to go to the polls and find out what you all think. Mike, Mike is putting up the poll. And um, Mike, are you going to give the instructions for the poll? Or these, oh, look, they all know how to do this. Basically, the question is, which is the most effective option among these choices that you can use to prevent challenges from becoming fails? Communication, talking. Termination, firing someone. Accommodation, giving in. Or negotiation, working with someone. And, Again, I think these things can be viewed from both the view of the evaluator and the view of the client. So we'll let this soak for a minute. Oh, look. We're getting some good results. I love that there's, there's at least one person in the audience that's up for firing someone. I think that's... <laughs> All right. It looks like our responses are all tabulated well. As our bars indicate, it was something of a trick question, because I suppose you might need to ultimately fire someone or ultimately give in to someone just to save, save the battle for another day. But what we're talking about today is actually about both communication and negotiation, and importantly, Importantly, um, uh, how one contributes to the other. So we're going to talk about communication as being a tool to get to negotiation. However, uh, there are some other tools that can be used, I would argue, are very important to engage in those communications in order to get us to effective negotiation. So we can close the poll, and the polls are closed. Let's talk about evaluation plans. I think this is a term that a bunch of you probably will be familiar with. Uh, we typically operate with something that gets called an evaluation plan. Oftentimes, it comes from the proposal that an evaluator writes or that a PI writes to a funder. Um, and typically, these things describe a lot of different aspects of what is going on. However, they're not very consistent. Uh, and they don't always do all of the things that I'm going to argue today are really important to making sure that we avoid fails. I'm going to talk about three different functions, and I'm going to use some keywords over and over again. Um, I'm going to argue that documentation of any evaluation should do all three of these things. Um, they are a combination of committing to the work, uh, defining what the PI, the client's money is going to buy, and importantly, uh, defining the technical aspects of the evaluation that is going to be central to the work that is contracted for. But again, three separate functions that very often get squashed into uh, a single evaluation plan. Now, we're not going to talk about specifically how to create these new documents, this new way of thinking, um, but we're going to consider how you can actually use them to support good communication and contribute to negotiation and avoid, avoid fails. Uh, hopefully, then, you will think that this is interesting enough that you'll go back and uh, pursue looking at ways to improve what you're doing with documentation. So here we go. Three key functions. These things include a legal contract, a scope of work, and one or more study protocols. And again, I'm going to talk about these things as though they are separate documents, but try to think of them as separate things that you're trying to accomplish, separate purposes for documentation. 
All right, let's start with the lawyers. The legal contract, this is the binding commitment that's agreeing to do an evaluation. It's a commitment of the parties involved to a specific set of obligations. And importantly, it uses language that's, that potentially is defensible or can be worked out in the courts if, in fact, it does get to the point where someone gets fired or sued. <laughs> We're trying to avoid that clearly. But in a, in a good uh, distinction between this function and the others I'm getting ready to talk about, the contract needs to include a general statement of the work that's going to be done. It's got to describe the period over which the work is going to be performed. It's got to detail the price and, of course, all of the invoicing minutia so that the billing can happen. And it's got to typically include a bunch of specific terms and conditions. So you've all seen these lists of things that both parties agree to when they say, yep, we're going to cooperate. We're going to take this project on, this evaluation, and, and uh, execute it for a client. Um, the second big piece of, of this documentation set of, of documentation tools is the scope of work. The scope of work has got to take the, has got to elaborate or expand upon the contract to describe the specific evaluation services and deliverables in enough detail that you all can avoid confusion over the life of the work. This is a huge tool for keeping everybody on the same page. It's got several components. One, you've got to make sure that the evaluation purpose is clear. So is this formative feedback to improve something? Is it a formal developmental evaluation that's going to include pilot testing that takes something from a good idea to a final product? Is it some kind of efficacy testing where you're trying to, in quotes, prove that it works? You've got to have enough breakout of the activities that are contributing to that work, again, that everybody knows what's supposed to be happening. All of that has got to be on a timeline so they know when it's going to be happening. And typically, the scope of work has got to describe the deliverables that are going to result, whatever is going to, what tangible stuff is going to be handed off uh, from the evaluator to the client at the end of the work. Now, a, a word of warning here. Uh, when we talk about the activities involved, and I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, but this is a place where it's really easy to get too much information into the scope of work uh, when, in fact, the details of the evaluation study, the data collection, analysis, and so forth, should be reserved for the last piece of Kirk's perfect evaluation documentation kit, the study protocol. Now, this could be more than one study protocol. Very often, we'll have, back to my examples, a formative evaluation to help improve the execution of a program, but then Perhaps in year two or year three, you're going to look and see whether or not it's actually making a difference. Is it working better than nothing? Or is it working better than the old program or an alternative program that might, might replace? That's got to be very clearly defined and translated into technical details of the evaluation research that's central to the evaluation services for which you are being contracted. I hope you're seeing how these sort of build one upon another. But specifically, the study protocol includes a study design, details about the instrumentation, how data is going to get collected or gathered up from wherever it is, if it's already out there somewhere, um, the processes for doing that. And I would argue that the instruments and how to use the instruments are two separate things, and they both need to be described in the protocol. Uh, and last but not least, specific analysis plan that is uh, a roadmap forward to take the data that are collected, whether it's quantitative, qualitative, or some combination thereof, to answer the questions that are guiding the study design from the outside. So again, three big pieces that serve three very different purposes. So, We've got, as Lori points out in the chat window, a question break. I'm hoping that I've poked at at least a few little hornet's nests out there, and you have some 
some burning questions that you'd like to share with the crowd. So you can put those in the chat window, just like you did uh, with your uh, feedback earlier. Kirk, it's Mike. Thank you. We do have several questions. Let me start with this one. You mentioned Kirk's perfect evaluation documentation kit. We like that. But these three things, I mean, are they are they merged together in a single document? Are they separate? Are they modifiable? Yeah, that's a fabulous question like? because we're used to just having one big homogenous thing, right, that tries to accomplish different purposes. Um, I, again, will start by saying that it's three different functions. The contract should do what only the contract should do and should not include information that's going to be in the scope of work or the protocol, at least to the extent possible. The scope of work should define the legal relationship between the client and the, evalu and the evaluator, so their responsibilities, for example, for, for contributing to uh, publications or something like that that's, that's just about the work. And thirdly, the study protocol is where you really get specific about the data collection and details. Now, in some instances, these things can all be three separate documents, physical documents. In some cases, I'll manage them as separate electronic documents and put them together depending on who I'm communicating with. So the contract and the scope of work may be submitted with the scope of work as an appendix, but it's managed as a separate document. The protocol then could be a document that maybe some clients don't even need to see. If it's a bunch of detailed stuff about analysis, it doesn't really add, add utility for the client. You maybe don't need to share it, uh, so maybe keeping it as a separate document is going to be useful. So that's a long way of saying it kind of depends, but having the flexibility of thinking of them as three modules or three separate pieces of the kit can give you the flexibility that they can all do what they need to do. Good. Thanks for that response, Kurt. The One of our colleagues wonders if there's examples of these sorts oh, of things. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm jumping to the end, but we've got some templates that uh, we'll make available to share. We don't have um, we don't have any completed examples. It's difficult to negotiate sharing stuff like that, but um, we thought that sure. providing a, a, some templates to get people thinking about what might be in a scope of work and a study protocol would be useful to continue this conversation. Excellent. You know, Kirk, there are several other questions that have appeared, but you know what? I'd like to reserve those towards the end and make sure you had a chance to uh, to present the materials that you All have. Right. So why don't we hold off on further questions? You, you go ahead and take us further. further. So this is where it gets fun. Um, as I said, we're going to jam a lot of fail into a very short period of time. So what we've done is we are going to have evaluation drama for you in three short acts that gives you some examples that you can think about in terms of project implementation delays, evaluation scope creep, and project changes. So let me set the scene here. We have an imaginary project. In this case, it's a ATE project. Um, it's developing a new program to train technicians in 3D printing technologies. Implementing the program, uh, there's three major components. They're purchasing, uh, updating new equipment in additive manufacturing labs. They're developing new coursework. And they're supporting the implementation of that coursework with some training for faculty. Now, the evaluation plan has been written. It's uh, going to be looking at the implementation of all the grant-funded activities. It's going to look at faculty readiness to teach these new courses from the, the professional development. And it's going to look at three different outcomes for students, their satisfaction with the coursework, sort of their immediate reactions, student learning, and ultimately student persistence and completion in the program. In terms of data collection, a lot of this is going to look familiar to those of you that have done this sort of thing. So it's fairly common. We've got document review scheduled, looking at evidence uh, from the uh, uh, update and development of the uh, curriculum. We've got a student survey that's going to be implemented. There's going to be some observation of the physical spaces of the labs. 
There's going to be interviews of key project staff to understand implementation and quality and what they're doing. There's going to be some course embedded student assessments that are just incidental to the actual coursework that's being delivered. There's going to be some institutional data that gets pulled in to look at those persistence and completion outcomes. And there's going to be some observation of faculty training. So it's time for some drama. I'm going to introduce my co-star, Lori, again. Lori is going to be stretching <laughs> beyond her normal role to play the client. And as we go through this, listen to see if any of this sounds familiar. And more importantly, watch to see how we go to the documentation tools to try and turn these challenges that emerge into resolution, into negotiation, and not allowing them to become fails. So Q, Lori. Hey, Kirk. So we have a little problem. Um, you know how my co-PI, co Jill, she was going to design the new courses for this project? Well, she left the college to take a new job, and it's going to be early March before we can even start the hiring process. And you know, classes start in September. So we're pretty sure we're not going to have the new courses developed in time, and that is going to set back our whole project oh, and boy, the evaluation. Oh, boy, Sorry to hear that. But uh, I think it sounds to me if the project and the evaluation purposes haven't really changed, uh, this may just be a timeline issue. Uh, you're not changing what you're doing, right, just when it's happening. Ah, okay. That's so right. I'll tell you what. Um, let's take a look at the year one evaluation task timeline. Um, you have the scope of work document there in front of you. Good, good. Um, yes, I do. Take a look at the timeline, and let's start with uh, how long it's going to take to get hiring done. Do you have a sense of that yet? Yeah, I think the earliest we'd have the position mid -April. built is April. Okay, mid -April. so a couple of questions that are coming out of that. First, are there things you can be doing while you're waiting for your new person to be hired? It's cool for Jill, sad for you. Uh, and secondly, what tasks have you got to wait until that position gets filled in order to, to finish? Hmm. Well, we can, we can bring our team together to start course development based on the work that Jill has already done. But I think we're going to have to wait till our new person is hired. Right. To okay, start yeah. Well, training. you know, the good news is I think we can work with that in terms of getting the evaluation done. Uh, it looks like we're going to need to delay evaluating the training, no question, because that's being pushed off. But it looks like you're still on track to launch the course in the fall. Training will happen before then. So I don't think there's any impact of the plan uh, impact of your change on the evaluation plan for student data collection. OK, good. So do you think we'll need to make any changes to your contract? Because you know yeah, that was a real yeah, key. Yeah, I remember. That's, that's fairly typical as the way as these things go. Um, tell you what, um, you've got the contract there. It should be stapled to the front of the scope of work. Let's look at that and run through this. So yep. uh, it's a renewable one-year contract. In fact, it expires at the end of September, so we're going to have to renegotiate, excuse me, renegotiate it anyway. Um, so there's no implications that. Invoicing looks like we'll be fine because it's fixed price. Let's see. We're still going to do all the work planned for year one, so you're fine with that. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. It doesn't look like we're going to have to get the contract people involved uh, since the timeline and the evaluation activities aren't in the actual contract. Uh, and we were clever enough that we put in there that the scope could be changed without going back to the contract. Uh, so let's do this. I'll put the changes into a revised timeline in the scope of work and save a new version of that on your shared drive. Um, you and your team review it, give it your final approval, and we can use that to keep track of how the timeline has been adjusted as we go. Well, that sounds good. And you know, Kirk, I really like how we can look at those documents whenever we need to. I find it's really helpful. Good, good. I'm glad that works for you. That's kind of the point of that. So, and scene. Let's recap here. What did we hear? Or what, what, what do I hope you heard? Um, number one, again, timeline changes are super common. This happens all the time in our work. These changes can oftentimes be accommodated just by moving work around within an established contract period. The timeline details are defined in the scope of work. And if that's the case, we can tweak the days or weeks or month 
to guide exactly what we do and then to guide the conversation, the communication necessary, that we get the negotiation necessary, that everything is still cool, and we've avoided this challenge turning into a fail. Um, and as uh, Lori pointed out, it's useful uh, if all of those tools are available to everybody involved. So there we go. That was your classic timeline challenge. Let's, let's talk about scope creep. This is a little more complicated, so it's, it's a little more fun. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'm walking across the office and my phone rings, and I pick it up. Hey, Kirk. I uh, haven't talked to you in a while, but you know, great work on the evaluation so far. Uh, we have just a little problem. The instructors are telling us that our students are complaining about getting surveyed to death, so they're really pushing back on doing the online survey of students in their classes. So our team decided that you should do focus groups instead of surveys when the students yeah. are in the lab. Yeah, well, the cool, good news right? is we can absolutely adjust, but we're going to have to make sure that we're collecting the data you really need. Um, can you pull up a copy of the study protocol? It's on the shared drive, and we'll take a look at it together. All right, let's see. Sure, Looking at the data it. needs, uh, it says here you need, uh, you wanted the survey to uh, learn about student satisfaction, including their confidence with the new 3D printing technology. Uh, do you still want to find out what your students think about those things? Is there anything not already on that list uh, in the protocol document we should worry about? Yeah, we still want to know the same things for sure. We just really need feedback from students to make sure these courses okay, are as good so as they can be. You want to learn the same things, but you want to learn use focus groups instead of surveys. Tell me more about that. Yeah, that's right. So the thing is, survey response rates on our campus right mm -hmm. now are at about 10% on average. And I promise you, we've tried everything, and the students just mm -hmm. don't do surveys anymore. So I know even though a survey is simpler, in the end, I think it's just going to be a waste of time if just 10 or 12 Yeah, yeah, fair time, enough, fair think? enough. Um, you probably already know this, but I want to make sure that we talk about it. Um, we aren't going to be able to include all of the students in the focus groups. You've got like 120 students enrolled in these courses, and the original plan was to survey all of them. With focus groups, we'll be able to get more in-depth feedback, but it's going to be coming from a lot fewer students, probably just 15 or 16 if we do two focus groups. Oh, well, why would you Oh, yeah, do sorry, I kind of jumped to that without telling you what I was thinking. Focus groups. Uh, they're much more time intensive than doing the online survey, so that has big implications for your evaluation budget. We're going to need to put two people from the evaluation team out on your site. Um, we're going to have to come up with the times and locations for the focus groups because they won't involve all of the students, so we can't do them in classes. We'll probably need to get incentives to get students to contribute to an hour-long focus group rather than uh, filling out the survey. Uh, we're going to need to check with our Human Subjects Institutional Review Board folks to make sure there's no way that, uh, that uh, we accommodate all of the consent rules because there's no way to make focus group data anonymous. Um, the biggest hit on your time and your budget is that it's going to take more time to analyze and write up qualitative data that comes out of the focus groups compared to what would come out of the survey system. Oh, wow. I, I did not realize it would be so complicated. But you know, I still right, think it's the right cool. thing to and, do. And um, it sounds like it's really important for you to get that feedback. feedback. Uh, the good news is that we can get more in-depth understandings of what students are thinking from focus groups. Yeah, right. And we, you know, we aren't trying to prove that this new program works. We just, at this point, really just need to make sure we're getting good feedback so we can improve the courses before next term. So what are the yeah, implications well, of the tell budget? You what, take a look at the scope of work. You see a table there where we have all of the different data sources and the different activities detailed. Um, look at that cost and uh, task table in the scope of work. I think... For example, we could make some changes here. We could skip the lab observations. If you could provide us with documentation that all the purchases have gone through and maybe send us digital pictures of how it's all come together, would that work? OK, good. Oh, yeah, we can so you'll that. save a bunch of money there, not having us on site for that. Uh, we'll look at doing that. Also, uh, what we've seen so far suggests your project implementation is pretty much on track in spite of losing Jill. Uh, given that, I think we might be able to get away with not doing so many staff interviews this year. 
um, we could save you some money there and free up evaluation year one budget uh, that we could commit to focus groups. Okay. Yeah, All right. Tell you what. Let's do this. Um, I'll put together a revised version of the task and cost table and do all of the math based on our hourly estimates of what's going to be required to, to do the focus groups and not do the things we've talked about. Uh, I'll send that to you and your team can look at it and if it all works out and we're able to make it within the budget, um, you sign off on it and we'll move forward. Sound like a plan? Sounds great, Kurt. Oh, you're the best. To hear that. All right. You can tell it's it's fiction because I got all kinds of great feedback. No. <laughs> all right, so let's recap Act 2, the creep. Um, number one, it's important to note here, and this, is, this comes out of a couple of real-world examples that, that I have seen with clients uh, for some of the reasons that Lori did a good job of explaining. This risked uh, some changes turning into real scope creep, right, where the work grows beyond what could be afforded under the original budget. There were completely legitimate reasons for changing the data collection strategy, even though it was initiated by the client, and even though it increased the cost of risking uh, the cost of getting the data from the students. But the good news is because we had detailed all of the tasks in advance, we had the tools necessary that we could trim the scope of work, readjust what we were doing in year one, and reallocate funds to pay for the more expensive focus groups. Um, and lastly, uh, we were able to, com to uh, confirm by looking back at the study protocol that we were, in fact, still able to answer all of the questions that we needed to answer. All right, X3, <laughs> the end of the story. This is the change. This is a very, very important thing because, again, programs change very often on purpose. And uh, I hope you can see how that works with this little vignette. So, riggedy ring. Hi, Lori. Yeah, it's been a long time since we talked, and I just wanted to call and see how the project is going and see if there are any updates, anything I should know about. Oh, yeah. Everything is great, but some really exciting <laughs> really? new things. Love to hear about new things. What's going on? Well, you know how we've been trying to get Acme Manufacturing on board with us as an industry partner? Well, they have this new vice president for human resources, and she's been meeting with, with us regularly for the past two weeks. And based on our conversations with her, we've decided to add an internship component to our program. And instead of running our usual projects in the labs, we're going to be working on real-world projects that they supply us with. It's such a great opportunity for our students. And, you know, we shared these changes with our grants program okay, officer. Good. Wow, that is exciting. Lots of changes. Them. Yeah, it's been exciting. Yeah, you know, I hadn't actually thought about how that might affect the evaluation, <laughs> yeah, so no I didn't problem. let you know sooner. The good news is uh, we can accommodate all of this stuff. You know that by now. Uh, very important, the, the ATE program, remember, and I'm preaching the choir here, it's about innovation, right? Developing and testing these technology, uh, these technician training programs. Um, so it's good news that you've kept your program officer up to date, but really there's no penalty for changing what you're doing. And our job is to evaluate what you do and how well you do it and whether it works, uh, not whether you're doing exactly what you proposed. So that's all fine. Good. OK. okay um, now I'm going to assume, because the grants office has said that it's OK, that the main purpose of the evaluation and your evaluation budget are probably unchanged, right? Right. Okay. It's just so that what? some parts of the project are changing. <laughs> Okay, so the good news again is that uh, we can revamp all of those pieces of the puzzle. Uh, and it's kind of good news because remember we're coming up on the end of year one of the evaluation contract here in a month and a half. So it's actually perfect timing to revisit what we're doing for you. Uh, it is, however, I think a bigger conversation than what we can get done today. So what if we schedule a web conference uh, so we can talk about your evaluation scope of work and study protocol and the contract uh, in a comprehensive way with your whole team, uh, maybe next week? Okay, fabulous. Sure, Good timing. Works. And we'll change what we need to change and get you set up for year two with your improved and new and exciting program. 
All right, and scene. Great. So, a quick recap. Um, it's important to remember, and I hope you all are seeing it, even though it can be helpful um, to change the scope of work um, and the study design, the protocol separate from the contract, sometimes it is necessary to go back and revisit the entire thing. Now, in this fiction, we had the contract naturally ending at the uh, completion of year one. This is sometimes how these things go. Um, but again, if you keep these document purposes separate, however they're built out, you've got the flexibility to have these conversations. Uh, and most importantly, and this is the message that I hope everyone's taking away from this, the evaluation has got to be responsive to what's happening with the program in real life, whether it's by plan or by accident. So at the end of the day, we've got the three pieces of documentation that we've talked about in our kit. And if we combine that with communication as good as client Lori is communicating in our drama today, we can count on some improved chance that we will be able to uh, avoid uh, fails through negotiation. Now, it's kind of the moral of the story here. We, uh, we've got resources, as uh, we alluded to earlier on. Um, you know, some of you may already have looked at the links, but um, the two templates that we've made available, they're in word form for download. Um, I developed these when I was uh, with my previous employer. And um, I've used them in a lot of trainings. So they're in the public domain now. They're licensed under Creative Commons CC BY rules. That means that you can take them, modify them, use them, including for commercial purposes. So anything you want to use out of the templates that uh, you have available for download, um, please feel free to go for it. Um, uh, if push comes to shove and you need another resource, give me a call or send me an email, kirk at insider.io. I love this kind of stuff. I love problem solving and making evaluation work better for clients and making clients better able to engage with evaluators. So if there's anything I can do, let me know. And I believe it's question time again, Mike. Thank you, Kirk. I it is. It is. We have several, Kirk, and I have to admit, we really enjoyed those three acts. They were, they were just fun. I think all of us could relate to them. One of the things that came up is as you're reframing things with your clients, what about that logic model or theory of change? Do you, as evaluator, go in and adjust it? Does the project adjust it? Yeah, fabulous question. That? Um, I didn't talk much about that because I always advocate for revisiting the logic model or the theory of action of a program in an ongoing way. At the very least, you ought to have a collaborative conversation between the evaluation team and the folks running or designing the program uh, once a year at a bare minimum. If things are changing more regularly, I would propose that that should be a working document that gets included in all kinds of ongoing conversations. So the answers to the question are as often as possible or as often as useful. Um, and collaboratively involving everybody that's involved. Excellent. Let me just point out one thing. Um, there is the link that Lori put in the chat window to evaluate website where these templates are. So thank you, Lori, for, for doing that. Kirk, here's another question for you. Um, one of the things, and several people brought this up, is how the timeline can change. That was part of your act. You mentioned how hard it is sometimes to get started contractually and all this stuff. I know this is a somewhat simplistic question, but is there anything we can do right at the beginning to help shorten those timeline issues, something we could prepare better in the beginning to shorten that horrible timeline in the beginning? Um, I, the primary thing that comes to mind is to be very, very sure before you start those final steps that get kicked into gear with the grant award. So the procurement rules, if you've got to put the evaluation out to bid, um, the, uh, the processes that are going to be in place to get started with uh, procurement, all of that stuff. Figure out what those steps are and make sure everybody that needs to know what they are are sort of primed for what might be coming. 
That way you can hit the ground running uh, and be ready to uh, to uh, go with with work on the ground, both in terms of implementing the program and in terms of the evaluation keeping up with the program. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, developing pre-approved vendor lists, for example, for evaluators. I know a lot of institutions will do this and sure. have some folks that are sort of ready contracted, and then you don't have to worry about the minutia of the contract. You can go straight to conversations about the scope of work. Uh, make sure that you've got a really solid theory of action evaluation plan that's, that's had a lot of thought going into it before the work is proposed. Uh, that's going to be an important tool for having conversations between the evaluation team and the project team. And it could be a long list, but of course, remember, you're doing all of that stuff sort of against the possibility that you will get funded, so you do have to be pragmatic about that. Sure, sure. Well, those make sense. got one more question, several in the window, but I think we'll just take this one more. I think something that resonated today with a lot of people, Kirk, is, is developing trust with your client. For example, in your act, it was clear in your three-act play, it was clear that there was a trust there that you could talk about things. Have you run into problems where it's been difficult to do that or any sort of, you know, advice you could offer us on building that trust? Absolutely, and I'm laughing because it sounds from today's conversation like I really know what's going on, right? But Every single example that we've talked about, and a lot of really horrific examples I have not talked about today, are because I did it wrong somewhere in the past. I have been fired as an evaluator. I have fired clients as an evaluator. Um, and ultimately, trust and communication are a huge part of avoiding it coming to blows, right? Getting to those options that in our poll that we chuckled about because only one or two people clicked on them. But um, I think trust is something that is earned. It doesn't happen automatically. And I think it's something that as an evaluator, part of what we're getting paid to do is leverage our professional skills to help improve trust. That comes from communication. And that's what allows us to negotiate when things get tough. Um, You'll notice that every time Larry asks for something new, I said yes. But that's because I knew that we had the tools that I could always say, yes, we can do that, and here's how we're going to do that without compromising the rigor of the evaluation, without putting my firm and my researchers in a position where they were working for free, and in a way that gives everybody what they need. So I think that's a crucial part of it as well. Makes a lot of sense. All right, I got a quick one for you. You don't have to elaborate. Probably only got about 30 seconds for this one. If something comes up that's going to require more costs, and they don't have it in their budget, and yet they really want to do it, do you ever in a position where you're going to eat that cost? Let's suppose it's not too large. I have, and I'll tell you when I can. If I can do it knowing that it's going to help build relationships and potential work for, uh, for the future, I can eat some of that cost as a essentially as a business development or advertising cost. And conference sure. attendance is sure. an example of that. I would not necessarily charge a client for that if I'm also going to be able to meet folks and get out and learn what's what's needed in the marketplace. Great answer. Perfect, Kurt. No, thank you for, for everything today, especially the uh, Kirk's perfect, perfect evaluation documentation kit. We really like that. Colleagues, let me uh, and Kirk pause for a moment and hype our next webinar coming up on February 20th. All of us will relate to this basic principles of survey question development. Boy, that's a tough road, and I've seen some really good resources from Evaluate on that one, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Kirk and Lori, thank you very much for your presentation today. Colleagues, at this point, we're right at the top of the hour, the end of our webinar. It's time to ask you for your input, your feedback on today's webinar. So what I'm going to do now is to launch the survey in two ways. A new window for many of you will pop up on your computer, and then you'll just simply answer the survey questions. For some of you, that may not open. And so I'll paste the link in the chat window as all, as we, uh, so you'll have a chance to do it as well. Colleagues, Lori, uh, Kirk, thank you again.
survey is now open in a new window, so please, folks, just go ahead and take it. And uh, I'm going to now paste that survey in another window to make sure it happens. That officially concludes our webinar today. That concludes our recording of the webinar. You will receive a link to the recording. And thanks, everyone, to our presenters and to you, our attendees, for coming today. Goodbye.